Baruch Hashem. Let's get started. We, um, Zat Hashem, continuing on with our lunch and learn. And we're going to learn today two stories in Mesechet Megillah. Because, you know, Baruch Hashem, we just started Adar. Friday, Shabbat was Rosh Chodesh. Adar Rishon, two Adars this year, which is even more Simcha, Baruch Hashem. And uh, we're going to see today two stories in the Gemara about the mitzvot of the day of Purim. So we know on Purim there's four mitzvot that we actually are chayav to do. We have the mitzvah of Seuda or Mishte. The way that you could remember is four mems. Mishte, which is the Seuda party. Everybody loves that one. Matanot lev yonim is gifts to the poor. And what is that get, that, that mitzvah, by the way? No, no, matanot lev yonim. What is the mitzvah to give to two different poor people a certain sum of money? We also have the mitzvah of Megillah, one of the most famous ones, which is reading the Megillah, the night, and also the day. And the last one is Mishloch Manot. Four memim. Mishloch Manot is a, what's, what's the bare minimum? Two foods to one person. Two foods to one person, that's the bare minimum. So we're going to go through on Zayin and Mudbet, the Mesech and Megillah, two stories that discuss these mitzvot, as we'll see, and we'll see a little bit how the Mephorshim learn these stories. In particular, by the end of today, hopefully we'll have a little bit more of a clarity in terms of this mitzvah of getting drunk. Everybody loves this mitzvah. Everyone thinks it's a hall pass to get drunk and act like a wild animal, but that's not true. It's not true. <laughs> I'll just tell you in advance, that's not necessarily true. Yosef, good to see you, my friend. You know, we figured it out. Yosef, good to you. Thank you very much, Yosef. So, Bezat Hashem, let's get started. We're going to start with a Gemara in Mesechet Megillah and Zayin Murbet with an interesting story. This is a story of Amoraim where one wanted to send a gift of Mishloch Mano to his friend. Okay, to his friend. We'll see great rabbis. Rabba and Mari, as we're about to see. But the Gemara tells us as follows, Rabba, it's the top of Zayin Mubet, in Sechet Megillah, Rabba Shadar Lamari Barmar Biyad Abaye, Rabba wanted to send Mishloch Manot to Mari Barmar. Okay, Rabba is one rabbi, Mari Barmar is another rabbi. So what did he send Mari Barmar? He sent Maletaska de Kaspa, a bag full of dates, Umalekosa Kimcha Dav Shuna, and a cup full of sweetened flour. Dates and flour. Now, does that sound like an exciting mishloch manot? Yeah. Dates and flour, okay? A, make you can make hamantash. You can make hamantash. Maybe that's why he was sending it. And he sent Abaye as the shliach. Abaye sent, Rabba sent Abaye to be the messenger boy, the delivery man. Abaye was the student of Rabba and also was his nephew. We know the story, Abaye and Rabba, nephew and uncle. Rabba was his Rebbe, his adopted uncle, he adopted him. And he sent these items in the hands of Abaye to deliver to Mari Barmar. Amalei Abaye, Abaye said to Rabba, Hashta Amar Mari, I chakla malka lehave, tikula mitzav are lo nachit. Abaye said to Rabba, who was sending these foods, when the farmer, Rab, when, Abba, when Mari receives this, he's going to say, when the farmer becomes a king, he doesn't remove the basket of the peasants from his neck. Now it's an expression, but what he means to say is, you, Rabbah, you used to be a simple person. Now you're the Rosh Hashiva. Now you're the Rosh HaYeshiva. Hello. Now you're the Rosh HaYeshiva. Okay, now you're the king. If you would send simple types of foods when you're, before you became Rosh HaYeshiva, it's understandable. But now you're the Rosh HaYeshiva. So... Uh, when, when Mari receives this, he's going to say, why, why is Rava sending me such simple person type foods? Now, it would sound like he's saying, basically, you know, those like very fancy mishloch manot, like uh, hundreds of dollars. Those, why isn't he sending one of those? You have to know exactly what the pshat in that is, but that's what Abayi told Rava. Hadar lay ihu. So what happened was now, he received the liver, and then Mari Barmar wanted to send back a mishloch manot. So he gathered some stuff together, sent back to Rabba a mishloch manot in return, with Abai being the shliach. Hadar shadr le'ihu, malay taska de zangvila, 
a bag full of zangvila. Zangvila is ginger. Right. Okay, ginger. Interesting thing. He sent back ginger. Umale zangvil. Umale kosa de pelpilta arika and a cup full of long peppers. This is what Mari Barmar sent back: ginger and peppers. Okay, ginger and peppers. What? What are you gonna do with that? Exactly. He may make a good make a good stir fry. I don't know. Amar Abaye, Abaye said, Hash to Amar Mar, now, when Rabba receives this back, he's going to say, Ana Shadri Lechulia. He's going to say, I sent Mari sweet things. Ve'iyu Shadar Li Chorfa. And I sent, and, he, and I received back, he sent to me, what's Chorfa? Spicy. Spicy things. Because let's remember, Rabba sent a Mari pe, um, dates and sweetened flowers, sweet things. And, uh, and, and uh, Murray sent back to Raba pepper and ginger. No, so no. Murray was Sephardic. Yeah. And Raba. <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. Yeah. Anyways, you have to know what the Pshan the story is exactly, but they're commenting on the other one's Mishloach Manot. But firstly, there is an Inyan to have uh, Mishloach Manot delivered with a Shaliach, with a messenger. There is such a concept. Abaye was the messenger here. And you have to have two foods. Two foods, I know that's also part of the inyan, two different food types. That's the end of the story. Abaye now commented like this, very interesting. You know, Abaye said, when I left Murray's house originally to deliver the first Mishlach Manot, I was full, I wasn't hungry. Amar Abaye, Kinafki bimni beimar, when I left the house of Rabbah originally, have a savana, I was satisfied, I wasn't hungry. But when I got to Murray's house, they brought me 60 dishes of 60 types of foods. Okay, so they were having a big Purim party, clearly. And they brought 60 dishes of 60 types of foods. And I ate 60 pieces of food. And the last dish, they called it Tzli Kadar. They called it pot roast. Not only was it delicious, but I wanted to eat the plate afterwards. So Abaye said, 60 dishes, and the last one I wanted to even eat the plate. So Abaye commented, when I left Rabba's house, I was full. When I got there to Murray's house, I wanted to eat the dishes from how much food? What's Pshat? He was, before he was full, and now he's starving. What happened exactly? So Abaye, Abaye said his expression. It's like people say, Kafin anya veloyada. A poor man is hungry and he doesn't realize. If you're used to something, means you're used to a certain lifestyle, and you eat very little, you're not hungry. But when you realize what you're lacking, because you go there and you see that there's this big porn party, suddenly it goads your hunger, it pushes you to be hungry. Alternatively, something that I'm sure many of us are familiar with, inami ravcha lebisima shechiach. There's always room for dessert. That's an expression. Rav chalibesim ashchiach. There's always room for dessert. With food, with food comes the appetite. With food comes the appetite. Exactly. That's the idea. So Abai was commenting, before I wasn't hungry at all. And then when I came to Mari's house, now I suddenly got very hungry because Rav chalibesim ashchiach. There's always room for dessert. That's the story there. Okay, I'm going to skip the next thing. Now this is one of the most famous statements in all of Masechet Megillah. This is one of the statement that we sing, that we... Love to sing, especially when we're drunk. <laughs> and uh, what is that? <laughs> That's true, but not that. The, before that. That's true, but what does it start? How does that start? Have an agila. That's not a Purim. That's also on a Tuesday night. Okay, so Amar Abaye. Amar Rabba. Don't drink in Purim. Yes, it doesn't drink, no, no. drink at all. Amar Rabba. Rabba says, Mechayiv inish libisume bepuria. A person is responsible. Libisume bepuria. What is libisume? Blood. Eh? Blood, don't see. Oh, that's a summa, that's true. I mean, I mean, if you drink and you become blind, you got a problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's blackout drunk, that's really bad. <laughs> Levesume, that's not, that's not how Rashi explains. What's Levesume? Like Besamim? So it sounds like Besamim. Rashi learns Besamim means to become drunk on wine. Ah. So wine specifically, Rashi highlights. There actually is discussion in the, discussion in the Mefarshim if you're Yotze when you drink other alcohols. Very interesting. There is a discussion, and specifically Rashi says, to become intoxicated with wine. So what about liquor? No. What about, so no. maybe not. This is a discussion about this. So a person is obligated to be drunk on wine on Purim, ad 
Kelly does not know the difference between Arur Haman le Baruch Mordechai, between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. Now, what does it mean that you don't know the difference between Arur Haman and Baruch Mordechai? What does that mean? So we're going to see when we finish this sugya in the halacha, it's brought down. How do you actually fulfill this? What would you say at face value? What does it mean? Pashup shah. Pashup shah. So how much do you have to, like, what does that mean practically? Four cups at least. You drink too much. Like, like crazy, blackout drunk. That's what it sounds like. If you read it straight, it sounds like blackout drunk. Is that you drink so much, you don't know the difference between the cursed is Aman and blessed is Mordechai. That sounds like a very extreme statement. Right? Mm-hmm. Everybody sees that's extreme. In the middle. What do you, what do you say, Yosef? What do you, what do you think? It's just, it's there, but it's not, it's not a complete flip where you're totally knocked out. It's like, you can understand something, like you can understand that, but you can't earn reason behind it. You can, mm. you can be where someone will tell you that, and you'll say, oh, yeah, but then you won't even, you can't register. Okay, I hear that, I hear that. Now, however you learn, which we're going to see in the Mepharshim how this actually works out, however you learn, the Gemara seems to be saying you should definitely drink to a certain degree, right? We'll see, there, there are shitot that say it doesn't have to be very much. But if a, if a person is drunk, a person should always behold the Hadayo. Yes, yes. So how a person can be drunk. Excellent question. Beautiful question. We're going to see in the before show. He's not connected with a hundred percent. I'm with Matan on this question. It's a very valid question. That generally in Judaism, being drunk is not looked at in the greatest way. It's not. Like you just said, the Chol Derach you should know Hashem in all of your ways. You get drunk, generally it can also lead to inappropriate behavior. There's a lot of issues that could happen. That's why what I just said is, even though the simple pshat one might say is you have to get totally wasted, many of the mefarshim, as we're about to see, is not the pshat. It's not. It's pshat, not the pshat, because. It... Okay, we'll see. We'll get to that at the end of the story. But let's see the story first. Before you even get there, the Gemara tells us a story, so we understand. You have to be careful. So what's the story? The Gemara says like this: Rab of Rabbi Zera Avdu Seudat Purim Baade Adadi. Rabbi and Rabbi Zera made a Purim Seudat together. So one, one Purim, there was a, a party with Rabbi and Rabbi Zera together, two of the greatest rabbis, the greatest of the Amoraim. Big party, you can imagine, there was people there, wonderful. Ibsum, they got drunk. Come Rabbi, Rabbi got up, Shachte le Rabbi Zera. What does it mean, Shachte le Rabbi Zera? Slaughtered Rabbi Zera. Rabbi slaughtered Rabbi Zera. Okay, we're talking about the greatest of the Chachamim. Rabbi got drunk and he slaughtered Rabbi Zeira. That's what it says. So when you say, Kola Gadol Mechavarok Gadol Ipsro, so he also uh, okay. gets a Rabbi Zeira. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. One rabbi killed the other rabbi. One rabbi killed the other rabbi. That's a simple pshat in the story. It's not a regular rabbi, it's a morah. A morah. We're talking okay. about people that could do Tchiyat HaMetim. Okay? Lemachar, the next day, he realized that Rabbi Zeira is dead. Oops. Bayi Rachame, so he dove into Hashem. Va'achia, and he brought him back to life. No, Amoraim could do tchiyat ametim, no problem. So Rabbi Davin, there was a Shushan Purim. Everyone was starting to get back to their senses. Where's Rabbi Zera? And he said to the Beit Midrash, where's Rabbi Zera? Where's Rabbi Zera? Ah, you killed him yesterday. Oh, okay, Davin's to Hashem, he comes back to life. Not bad, right? So Va'achia, Lishana, so the next year, Rabbi approaches Rabbi Zera. Amarlin, he says to Rabbi Zera, Neti Mar Sudat Purim Let's do the Suda again together. <laughs> Would you accept that invitation? <laughs> Rabbi, Zera, Rabbi Zera wasn't so excited. So Amarlin, Rabbi Zera said to him, Lo v'chol nisa. Not every moment is there going to be a miracle. Meaning, for me to go die and then come back, I can't rely on that every year. We learned actually, Ein Somchin Alanes. You're not allowed to rely on miracles. So to assume that I'm going to get killed and then re 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 Animated, brought back to life, that's, that's not something I'm going to rely on. I can't uh, rely on that. Now, some of the Mepharshim learn, the reason this story is brought right after Mechaev Inish Libesume, that you need to get drunk, is to highlight the fact that what? That there is a limit. you got to be careful, meaning it's to highlight the fact that if you can't control yourself, you shouldn't be drinking. That's the simple shot. So at first it says it's a mitzvah to get drunk, but then it tells us a story where people went over the top and it was a problem. Now, before we go ahead, I'll just tell you, there are many Mepharshim, including the Ben Yoyada, who explain that he didn't physically kill Rabbi Zera, because that's just, 
very difficult to imagine, but rather they were learning Torah on such a high level. And many Mepharshim say, I think the Rebbe actually says a similar word, on such a high level of Limura Torah that the soul of Rabbi Zeir like left his body. It was like some sort of like a spiritual reality that occurred causing Rabbi Zeir to die. And then he prayed afterwards, and he prayed afterwards to bring him back to life. So some... Uh, Excuse Raba, if you want to say it like that, or explain the Gemara, so it doesn't sound so bad that Raba killed. So Shachte means in Torah. They say they say such an idea. There are Mefarshim who learn that way. There is such a pshat. But before we go ahead with that, let me tell you a fascinating question the Ben Yehoyada talks about. The wife of Rabbi Zera. Okay, this is a side point, but I think it's a fascinating nekuda. Rabbi Zera was killed. Let's say he was killed, right? Is she? Married still to Rabbi Zera. Well, if he's dead, then what's the halacha? Well, if she's dead, if he's dead, excuse me, if he's dead, so what's the halacha? She's a widow. Now Rabbi Zera is back to life. Does Rabbi Zera have to remarry her? Or is she a almana? She's a widow. What would be the status with the wife of Rabbi Zera? If she's almana? Bring me a proof, Hebra. What? Bring me a proof. Something we learned. Something we learned recently. Actually, she would sure be a widow, but he was. He, he passed out. He was killed. Killed for the day. <laughs> and then he brought him back to life the next day. Thirty days for a woman to remarry. Logically, she can marry after thirty. Three months. You're talking about. You're right. No, but the question is, if she's a widow from when Rabbi Zera is killed, when he's reanimated, he has to remarry her. But. No. So is she considered a widow? If it's a or day, not? Well, Yosef, it's what do you say? What do you say? She, once, she, once she achieved the status of a widow, she remains a widow. You say she remains a widow. So he's brought back to life. They're not married. So, exactly. She's a widow. Course, Logically. Exactly. He just has to be very logical. Age, to I, I think Yosef's saying something very logical. He would have to give Kiddushin again, remarry her. And if he wouldn't, she's allowed to marry anybody else. Absolutely. Okay, I hear you. What do you say, Matan? Oh, none. Usually it's before the burial, right? Oh, no. Aninut. That period? Yeah, till burial. Okay, so what? So, if you... There was, there was a burial? There was, let's say there, uh, no burial, let's say, I don't know. Let's no. say no. So, so Onan... What does that have to do? There is, she's not permitted to marry because there was no even burial yet. Right? I don't think she, uh, she's a uh, widow. What do you mean? Meshu Shemetlo cannot put fill in all of this. It's true, but that's because... It's prohibited from certain things until there is a burial, right? No, no. So also she cannot make the mitzvah of uh, Kiddushin because there is no burial yet. What do, you, what do you mean? I don't understand what you're saying. What are you saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He wasn't buried. He was killed. If they didn't bury him, how she can remarry? Yeah. What's that? There was no burial. But he was dead. But he's dead. He's dead. He's dead. No. But still, there was no burial. So. See, if that's the case, you know how many people die and come back from life? So bring me a proof. <laughs> I died. Oh, I died life. good question. <laughs> You're saying he was dead at that time? Yeah. I don't know if that's halachically I dead. Halachically, I don't know. That's, that's a very interesting it, it, point. It, 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 if someone has some sort of a uh, accident of some sort, yeah. and he and then they revive him. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So listen to this. The Ben Yoyada quotes the Sefer Petachainayim, Petachainayim, and he says. Is she permitted to marry somebody else? Meaning, is, is she considered disconnected from him, like an almana? And does she need a new marriage to him after he came back to life? I brought a proof, he says. Does that mean Yisrael sheparcha nishmatam b'matan Torah? We know yeah. at Matan Torah, they what do we know happened? The when they heard the, the sound of Hashem talking to them, the Jewish people died, and Hashem had to bring them back to life with, with, with as a Sfarim, Tal call it, Tal Shel Tchiyah. It's the do of Tchiyat uh, Ametim. They died, and they, but there was no remarriage. They, they were still married to their wives. There is a different reason for the Torah. Tal Shel Tal Shel Tchiyah Bemidrash. It doesn't say they had to remarry their wives. So it seems to be in such a scenario, they're not considered disconnected. There's a discussion about Ben Ashunamit. 
Ben Ashunamit, does her son, the, the story in Navi over there was that the son passed away, and I believe it was Eliyahu and Navi, or Elisha, I don't remember which one it was. Elisha Ben Avuya, he said, Elisha, Elisha. And Navi Elisha, right? With a baby that he didn't receive the Nevoi anymore or something? I don't know if it was Eliyahu or Elisha's too. So the Navi brought the son back to life, and it's a similar idea is that the child, it's not considered like he was dead and disconnected, but rather that, uh, right, it's unbelievable. The way that he explains it actually in the Gemara is when the child was dead, he would be mitzame, he would convey tum'ah, but after he's brought back to life, he's a continuum. It's an unbelievable thing. But either way, the way he comes out is she does not need a remarriage, as we find by Matan Torah with the Jewish people. Anyways, that was a side point. Now, regarding this idea of drinking until you, you know, become uh, unable to distinguish between Aror Aman Baruch Mordechai. So, from like we just said, the Gemara itself seems to be teaching us the story of Rabbi and Rabbi Zeira to highlight the fact, right after, that it's not, you can't go crazy. You have to be controlled. There has to be some level of uh, control. So in Shulchan Aruch, it's brought down, actually exactly like the Gemara, it's uh, in Hilchot Purim. Shulchan Aruch tells us in Tafresh Tzadi Hey Seif Bet, Chayev Inish LeBesumi BePoya Ad Lo Yada Ben Aror Haman LeBaruch Mordechai. Shulchan Aruch says very straight. Tell you don't know the difference between Aror Haman Baruch Mordechai. Okay, but the Rama adds to that, and he says V'Yesh Omrim, and this this is something that many people practice. This what I'm about to read to you. V'Yesh Omrim De Ein Tzarich LeIshtaker Kol Kach. You don't need to get so drunk, rather drink a little bit more than you're used to. Let's say on a Shabbat you drink a cup of wine. So drink two cups, a little bit more, which makes you, which makes you tired, okay? And then, then you go to sleep. When you're sleeping, you don't know the difference between Aror Haman and Baruch Mordechai. Even if you don't drink, you don't know if you sleep. That's true, but you need to get drunk on wine. So therefore what you do over here, according to Ramah, this is, many people do this in the morning, They'll drink a little bit of wine more than they're used to drinking, which is not which is not that much. Makes you a little drowsy. You fall asleep when you're sleeping from that wine. You don't know the difference between Aror Haman Baruch Mordechai, and you fulfilled the mitzvah. Now, whatever you do the rest of the day, that's a different story. But that's a fulfillment of the mitzvah. Now, this is a very you could call it lenient approach, or <laughs> a lot of people don't like this this shita. But the Mishnah Rasa says that is what you're supposed to do actually. So it's kedai in the morning if you have a suda. Have a suda, drink a little bit of wine, go to sleep, and you're yotze. According to this, you're yotze. You can go to sleep in the morning. Okay, even Bangalore, for half an hour, yeah, half an hour. Take a half an hour nap, yotze. That's a very interesting Bangalore. thought over here. This is a quote, different shitot that say this. Ma'aril, different shitot. But he continues on and he says, whether you drink a lot or a little, it has to be mechaven l'shem shamayim. That's the, the bottom line. If you're not mechaven l'shem shamayim, forget about it. What do you want to say? If you do it on schnapps, then you're not yotze. So schnapps is a debate. Whiskey, liquor, that kind of stuff, it's debated because ultimately it says Rashi learns to get drunk on wine. It's significant because the mitzvah happened, the miracles happened through wine. With Haman, with Esther, with all these miracles. That's significant. Now, okay. I'm not going to paskin, but there is, I'm sure there's yesh al if you want to drink liquor, I'm sure. But the point is, is that there is such an idea to go to sleep like I just said. Now, in the Mishnah, yeah, what do you want to see us? I just think that the difference between cursing Mordechai and mm-hmm. um, um, curse Haman and Baruch Mordechai, you don't know the difference. Yeah. It's not that you didn't know the difference. It's that the, you're at the point where you don't even care about the difference. Okay. You don't care about the difference. Yeah. Like, oh, Beautiful. Don't, you talk, don't even talk to me about that. I don't Beautiful. Even care about that. Beautiful. That's- Excellent. So, so the Me'iri seems to learn this way, actually, what Yosef just said, which is you're supposed to drink enough that your mind becomes addled to a certain degree that Aror Haman and Baruch Mordechai, it's, it's the same thing to you. It means it becomes, because of your love for Hashem, you don't necessarily know which one is more significant than the other. It creates some sort of a... I saw the, in the Shara Tziyun, the, the, Shulchan, the, the Mishnah Barah brings down over here, a different idea is that the gematria of Arur Haman and Baruch Mordechai is the same. So if you reach a point that you can't calculate the gematria, so then you're yotze. Problem is most people can't do the gematria when they're sober. So it doesn't really help you very much with that. Okay, that really, wouldn't really help you. Yosef can do the gematria when he's sober. But a lot of people, they you know that's so good with, with numbers. So that's, <coughs> but either way, just listen to this and we'll finish off with this last point. And this is very important. 
The Mishnah Barurah and the Biur Lacha both say, if a person's going to drink and it's going to cause him to be mezalzel in mitzvot, if he's going to uh, miss he's going to miss tefillah, he's going to miss things that he should be doing otherwise, so then he doesn't have a leniency in the first place to drink. Because, or he's going to start uh, harming people, damaging people, things in a significant way that's inappropriate. Everything has to be L'Shem Shamayim. So therefore, if a person's going to drink and then start acting like a wild animal, really, and, and he knows that about himself, it's better fulfill the Ramah. Drink a little, go to sleep, you don't have to worry, be such a machmir in this regard. Unfortunately, what ends up happening very often is people take this as like a blanket hetter to just do anything. You get drunk and you act like a wild animal and crazy and hurt people and and mivazen mitzvot and mivazen pamidei chachamim and that's certainly so, not the right approach. So if somebody knows that about himself, he's going to act like that. He can't <laughs> let him drink a little, have a good time, but not act like that. So bottom line is, we're coming out is if we could control ourselves, behave like human beings, it's great. Do the mitzvah properly, but not chas uh, v'shalom in a bad way. I will stop here, Chavah.